So who here has written some Kotlin before? Who here has written a lot of Kotlin? OK. So it seems like the people who have, for the most part, have like really you know, had a chance to dive deep into it. Hopefully, we can reach all different levels in this talk. But what we're mostly going to be talking about is some of the unique features in Kotlin that might seem weird to you if you're coming from a Java background. So as I mentioned before, my name is David. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I could always use some more Twitter followers. Okay. So aggressive inline, higher order functions. We're specifically going to be talking about function types and higher order functions and what they mean for you when you're writing Kotlin code. So you may have heard something along these lines. It's become almost an empty platitude at this point. Uh, functions are first class citizens in Kotlin. Okay, What does this mean? Well, when you're writing a Java application, and there will be some Java code and Kotlin code in this talk, uh, when you're writing a Java application, if you want to get some code running, well, at the bare minimum, you have to have something like this. You have to have a class. That class has to contain you know, a main function or, or main method, as it's referred to in Java. So there's a bit of kind of boilerplate, if you will, around you just running code at all. Now, the simplest case in Kotlin is just a main function. Okay? Now, it looks similar to the main method in Java, but the key difference here is that this function can live on its own outside of a class at the top level in a file. And more than just functions can live at the top level of a file in Kotlin. Classes, functions, variables, okay? We're a lot more flexible in Kotlin as to what we can define and where. We're not directly tied to this object-oriented model where everything is tied back to a class instance, okay? So why I bring this up is to kind of give a, a brief introduction to how we think about programming in general. And I know that's, that's really broad. Uh, but when not everything is tied to a class, you can expand beyond the boundaries of object-oriented programming. And in Kotlin, Kotlin touches on a number of things that are traditionally closer tied to functional programming. Who here is familiar with functional programming? OK. So let's talk about syntax between Java and Kotlin. You may be familiar, well, if you're here, you're probably familiar with a string. So a string in Java is defined in a pretty similar fashion uh, to a string in Kotlin. Same with an integer, okay? This lowercase int keyword is representing an integer primitive in Java, and it looks pretty similar in Kotlin. But then you run into some syntax like this, okay? This is a function type. There's a lot more going on here, and you may not be familiar with the equivalent in Java. Uh, until Kotlin came around, you're probably not writing too many functions, um, like function-typed objects in Java. So what we're going to do over the next couple slides here is talk about this syntax, talk about how we got here, and then tie back into Java code. Because if you're picking up Kotlin on your own, or maybe you've picked up the uh, best-selling Big Nerd Ranch Guide to Kotlin coming this July. Uh, there are going to be a number of things that are familiar. Um, and I'm not sure if this is a term that's used in um, describing uh, like programming languages, but in written languages, you have this idea of a cognate. Something that looks like something in one language looks similar in another language. Okay, so you can tie a Java string to a Kotlin string. You can tie an integer in Kotlin to an integer in Java, but this is kind of out there. And in order to describe it, we need to go back to this term lambda calculus. Who has heard lambda calculus before? Okay, it's got calculus in the name, so it might seem kind of scary. But the origin is this dude, Alonzo Church. Okay, he originated this idea of lambda calculus. What is it and, and why do we care? Well, mathematically, Here's what lambda calculus sometimes looks like. Uh, it'll be described in this fashion. On the left here, we have x. x is some input. There's a dot. And that dot is really just a delimiter. And on the right side, we have y. y is some output. 
So we are given x and we get y. Now, maybe more intuitively for us, we can think of it in this way. Some function is going to be applied to x, and we're going to get y as an output, okay? Function could be anything. And in, you know, a pure sense, that function really isn't any of our business. We're not going to, you know, mess with it while it's doing its job. It should just purely take x and output y. So this sort of model, you can maybe see, in a more complicated sense, how we tie back to how we're representing this type, this function type in Kotlin, okay? On the left, we have some input, in this case a string, and on the right side of the arrow, we have some output, also a string, okay? So that's where this arrow operator comes from. On the left side, we have our input, or inputs, and on the right side we have our output. So for example, you could pass in David, apply some function, and get back David in all caps. Okay? So this is how the arrow operator comes into play, and this is where we get the syntax for a function type in Kotlin, describing the input and the output. You can see here our camel case converter takes in an input string, in snake case, it outputs a string that is split and then joined back together into camel case. Okay? If you're curious, line by line, we're splitting, uh, delim delimiting on underscores. We're joining everything back together while capitalizing it. And then we are decapitalizing that first letter, so we're back in camel case. Okay? So we provide an input of snake case. And we get back the string snake case, but in camel case. So a similar idea, just a bit more complicated. So that's how we define a function type in Kotlin. Now, most often when we define a function type in Kotlin, we're going to store a reference to it. And that seems kind of odd. Generally, and uh, if you're coming from Java, you think of storing references to instances of an object or of you know, some class type. But here we can do that with a function, and that's because this function is a function type. It is not itself a function that is defined with the fun keyword. It is its own function type. Now, once we have a reference to a function, what can we do with it? Well, we can invoke it. So we've stored this camel case converter. If we want to, later we can invoke this function using the invocation syntax, the parameters, just like you call a function. Now here we are calling camel case converter, passing in the string snick, snick case. And when that invocation occurs, all of the code that is defined in this function is going to be invoked or called. Okay. So we store references to functions so that we can later invoke them. Now, storing references to functions like this makes it really easy to kind of encapsulate simple operations, simple pure functions. They're not really um, editing or managing a whole lot of state. They're just doing simple little things. We can also, naturally, pass functions as arguments. Okay? If we have a reference to a function, we can pass it to another function. Okay? So here, this function, uh, print formatted text, takes in some string and takes in a case converter function. This case converter is going to define how we're going to print out this formatted text. Is it camel case? Is it Pascal case? Okay, could be really anything. But this idea of passing functions as arguments to another function is known as a higher order function. Who here has heard this word? Okay. Now, these principles, lambda calculus and high order functions, uh, they're not purely Kotlin ideas. Okay? They exist in all sorts of programming languages and before that in computer science theory. Now, here's how we describe a higher order function in pure math terms. If this f function, well, if it's a function, if, and if g is a function, then f of g of x is us passing this g implementation into the f function, okay? So this is a very, like, as 
simple as, as we can get. We're not talking about what the f function does. We're not talking about what the g function does. But what makes this a higher order function is that we are passing g of x into f of x. Okay. So a higher order function looks like this in your Kotlin code. All right. Beyond all that math, we'll get back into code. We describe a camel case converter. We pass that camel case converter into this print formatted text function. We're able to do that because one of the parameters in print formatted text accepts a case converter. And that case converter, all it says is that it takes in a string and outputs a string. Okay? So we can pass in any function that applies to or, or really is accepted by these terms. Input string, output string. Now, once we have accepted our argument, we're able to go ahead and invoke it. We can go ahead and use it later, all right? And that's really the useful part of, of passing around functions. You get to determine when and where they are invoked, okay? Higher order functions. A really, really powerful tool in Kotlin. And we're going to spend the rest of the talk here uh, talking about how you optimize your use of higher order functions and what you can do with higher order functions. Because they replace and enable a couple different patterns in Kotlin that you, know, you didn't really see in Java. One thing that we can do is pass an anonymous function as a higher order function. So here, print formatted text is taking in a string and it's taking in another case converter. Okay, it's taking in a function that takes a string as an input and outputs a string. But here we are defining the function that it takes entirely within the parameterization or in the invocation of the print formatted text function. Okay? So it takes a string, it takes our function type, but we have defined this function that it takes in entirely within this parameter. We're not giving it a name or anything like that. We're just passing it in directly. Now here, the function that we're passing in, well, it's not decapitalizing our first letter, so it's a Pascal case converter, right? If we have just this one-off little function type, we don't need to give it a name. We don't need to store a reference to it. We can just pass it in anonymously here. Now, one nicety that Kotlin provides is the ability to simplify our syntax when a function type, or a higher order function more specifically, is the last parameter in a function. So because print formatted text takes in a higher order function, or takes in a function type as its last parameter, we can improve the syntax like so. We close off our parentheses here, and then anything that's defined outside here within this anonymous function, well, that is passed to our function, print formatted text, as that final parameter. Okay? Yes? Where is it reference, or how is, where, what is it? So it is what is passed to this anonymous function here from join to string. So in this case, it is going to be okay. a string. Yeah. It's the default keyword uh, for an arms function, is that correct? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So in our case, we could, if we wanted to, replace input here with it. Now, we're not doing so here for clarity's sake because we have nested functions. <laughs> and it quickly becomes you know, really difficult to determine all right, what it is referring to. Obfuscated Kotlin co contest. Yes. <laughs> So we can simplify our, our syntax by just pulling out this anonymous function like out of that argument definition. Now, why do we care? Um, this doesn't seem like that big of an improvement, right? We've gotten rid of a comma, sure. But what this allows us to do is it's really what empowers us to write domain-specific languages, okay? Has anyone heard of Anko? Okay. Does anyone use Anko out of curiosity? Really? Okay, one person. Um, 
Anko or Anko, I'm honestly not sure which, is a domain-specific language or DSL that allows you to write views in Android, um, entire user interfaces. It provides wrappers for things like dialogues and uh, database interactions, but it allows you to do all of that in Kotlin. So if you've written a view in XML, it can be tedious. What Echo will do for you is it provides this DSL so you can write this entire user interface in Kotlin. Okay? Rather than defining a linear layout with a vertical orientation, well, you have this vertical layout uh, tag, we'll call it. Uh, you have a button tag. But under the hood, these are really all just functions. Okay? Let's, in particular, look at onClick. All right? OnClick, within this function, whenever our button here is clicked, this toast is going to be fired. So whatever code we pass into this anonymous function, it's going to be executed when our button is clicked. Now, under the hood, this is what that implementation looks like. And I've simplified it slightly. But OnClick takes in this function. Okay? This function takes in a view and it returns unit. It returns nothing. All right? So all it does in there is call set on click listener. Because this function type that takes in a view and returns nothing, because it is the last parameter of on click, we get to pull these curlies, this anonymous function uh, declaration outside of on click. So you can create, you can maybe extrapolate this idea out into how you can create entire domain specific languages out of this, this very simple concept. Well, fairly simple. I hate to say very simple. I do this for a living. Okay. What's the criteria for being able to pull out, um, like to not pass that argument in parentheses? Like, yeah. I know part of it's got to return unit or nothing. So it, do, it doesn't Something necessarily else? have to return unit or nothing. Oh, okay. It just has to be the last uh, parameter passed into a function. Okay. Yeah. In our case, on click, it's the only parameter. Now, in our case earlier here, in print formatted text, it takes in a string and it takes in a function type. And because that function type comes last, we're able to pull it out. Uh, has anyone here heard of uh, Android KTX? Okay. KTX is a uh, set of Kotlin extensions to Android um, unveiled by Google earlier this year that aim to provide wrappers around uh, the APIs that you know and love or love to hate in Android. Okay? It's essentially just a series of niceties. Now, one of the things that really one of the low-hanging fruit that KTX provides is moving um, any sort of um, function type to the end uh, to, to be the final parameter passed in because it enables a really, really pretty syntax like this. Okay. Now let's talk about interoperability because we've talked about Java. I just mentioned Android. Okay. How does this work on the Java side? Now if you're unfamiliar with interoperability on uh, in, in Kotlin, it is the killer feature of Kotlin, okay? It is the most important thing about Kotlin because it's why we're talking about it now. Kotlin interoperates fully with Java, meaning that you can call Java code from Kotlin and you can call Kotlin code from Java. Now, what this means is that the entirety of Java frameworks out there can be leveraged within Kotlin, namely the Android framework. And I say this is the reason why we're talking about Kotlin because if it wasn't for Android, Kotlin would still be a you know, pretty niche Russian programming language, right? <laughs> um, so it's, it's really essential to understand interoperability when you're talking about the story of Kotlin, okay? How, do, how does this function type look in Java, all right? Well, it looks kind of like this. If you were on pre-Java 8, Maybe you're on Java 6 or Java 7 because you are an Android developer, and for the most part, we cannot use Java 8 on Android just yet. Okay? Maybe you have a really good min SDK. I'm jealous. Pre-Java 8, this is what your function type looks like. It's 
literally a class called something like function one that takes in as type parameters your input and your output. In this case, two strings. Now that function one, um, well, it's an interface and you have to implement the only abstract method on that interface called invoke, okay? Invoke in this case takes in a string and it returns a string. And that corresponds to your input and your output. So this does the same thing, okay? Now, it's certainly uglier to look at, but it does the same thing. Now, if you are lucky enough to be on Java 8, if you're still writing Java code, you get to use Lambda notation, okay? Lambda notation is going to clean up your invoke method slightly, uh, but you are still casting to this function one interface, okay? So you can use function types when you're interoperating with Java code. You're not completely precluded from doing so. But it's going to be a little bit uglier. So that's something that you should maybe consider if you are in a code base that still does contain Java code. Any public, um, very commonly used APIs, maybe don't jump on the function type or higher order function uh, bandwagon just yet if you're working with Java developers because you know it will put the onus on them to work with this sort of syntax, right? Now the other side of that coin is drag them all over to Kotlin, kicking and screaming, you know, make them work with uglier APIs. But you didn't hear that from me. This is recorded. Uh, so that was function one. The interface was function one, and it's called function one because well, your function type takes in one input. There's also function zero, okay? Function zero takes no input. Now in Kotlin, that looks like this. Your input is empty, it's empty parentheses, and your output could be whatever you want. In this case, integer. Okay, this function just outputs the number two. In Java, that looks like this. You create a function zero, it returns an integer, so it has to have this type parameter, integer, defined. And, well, it just outputs two. Just like there's a function zero and a function one, there's a function two. Function two takes in two inputs, okay? In this case, we have two Booleans, and we are going to OR them and return a third Boolean. In Java, that looks like this. The function two interface takes in three type parameters. Now, does anyone know how many function interfaces there are? Ten. No, it goes all the way up to 22. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, 22 feels really arbitrary. Um, and it's not like, I honestly don't know what it was. At first I was like, okay, I'm scrolling. This is gonna go, all right, it'll go to 10. Maybe they'll go to 20, maybe 26 because they need, you know, uh, alphabet letters for their generic type parameters. No, it's 22. Uh, I'm not sure why. But you can have a really, really complicated higher order function. And this still works within our classical idea of lambda calculus, right? You can have multiple inputs and one output, okay? You could have 22 inputs if you wanted to. And that's allowed. But when you're interfacing with these you know, inputs and outputs on the Java side, <coughs> keep in mind you're using these different interfaces to define exactly what's going on. Now let's look at some of our earlier examples um, when we were first introducing higher order functions in Kotlin. Here's what they look like in Java. Print formatted text takes in a camel case converter, it's got a semicolon at the end, okay? And that camel case converter now is of type function one. Takes in a string, outputs a string. In order to actually invoke that, um, that camel case converter though, instead of using the invocation syntax, those uh, parentheses that we're familiar with from calling methods in Java or calling functions in Kotlin, we're using the invoke function, okay? Recall that invoke function is, or invoke method rather, is defined on our function one interface. So we're calling that directly, all right? And that's your only real difference here, other than the aforementioned 
function one type. What does an anonymous function look like in Java? Well, pretty similar. We're defining our function one, and then you know anything else that we do, whether it's via landed notation on Java 8 or you know, implementing the invoke method earlier than that, we'll do within this, um, within this argument, okay? And then lastly, our last parameter trick that we had in Kotlin, well, that doesn't exist at all in Java. So your code's going to look exactly the same and you won't get that nice formatting. So let's talk about the performance implications of function types because this is something that we do need to talk about. Okay. Just like our function type corresponded to some, like function one, function two, whatever the interface may be, uh, an object is allocated when you pass a higher order function in Kotlin. Okay? So you will have at least one object allocation. You might have additional method allocations, uh, depending on what all you're referencing from within your, um, your higher order function. So think about this. If you are passing a higher order function within a loop, for example, you, th this could be meaningful to you. One extra allocation, okay, maybe, maybe we don't have to sweat that. But if we are in a situation where we are memory constrained or battery constrained, like on mobile, okay, this does become meaningful. It may not be something that you notice today, but if you start adopting higher order functions throughout your code base, this sort of thing adds up. So how do we get around this problem? The answer is function inlining. Has anyone heard of function inlining? Okay. You can fold the contents of your higher order function into its call site. So wherever your higher order function is invoked, you can take its contents and just shove it in there. And in your bytecode, you'll actually see that code inlined right there. There are three keywords that we're going to use when we are inlining our functions. Um, in order of importance, inline, no inline, and cross inline, okay? So let's talk about the inline keyword. So print formatted text here. This is code that you've seen before. It takes in a case converter. It takes in this function type. Immediately, it goes ahead and calls case converter, okay? So in this case, a function one is going to be allocated. So you do have some memory overhead. The way we're going to get around this is by adding the inline keyword to print formatted text, okay? When we add the inline keyword to this function that accepts a higher order function, all of the contents of print formatted text here are inlined, or sorry, all of the uh, contents of this higher order function are inlined within print formatted text, okay? So this is not the syntax that you're going to actually see when you're writing your code. The only change that you have to make is adding the inline keyword to print formatted text. But what's going to be happening under the hood on the bytecode level is rather than some invocation of some function, case converter, you're just going to see the code within case converter, okay? This is the inline keyword. You skip that additional allocation, you're not using any extra memory. So this sounds great, right? Yes. I was say, it seems, uh, I've only like, been exposed to this concept briefly, but it seems interesting that inlines on, uh, like, on the function in general rather than like inline case convert, because case convert is what you're inlining. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so we're inlining on this entire function, right? And why isn't this our default case? Like, what's wrong with this? What is the catch, David? You're stringing me along here. Well, the catch is that pass functions are closures and so anything that you reference from within a function that you pass, well, it has to be accessible where you call it, okay? So let's say that we pass this print private value function to some other function, okay? And that other function is inlined. 
print private value is referencing secret code. Okay? And secret code, well, it might be visible to, or it might be accessible to print private value. But when print private value is later called, secret code may no longer be accessible. This is especially an issue for libraries. Okay? So if you create a library that exposes some higher order function, you need to make sure that whatever is passed has full accessibility to everything that it needs. Okay? Now the way that we get around this is the no inline keyword. Okay? While you place the inline keyword on an entire function, if you have multiple higher order functions that you're passing to your function here, you can place the no inline keyword to skip function inlining for that particular function type. So in this case, case converter, well that's going to be inline, but func is not. All right? And you can do this in a case by case basis. Okay? So that's the no inline keyword. So we've seen function inlining, we've seen the caveat, okay? The reason why this isn't the default case because you can reference things within your function that are just completely outside of the scope of your call site. And the no inline keyword is how we pick and choose what we're going to inline. The other keyword that you'll see uh, a lot less often is cross inline, okay? Cross inline is useful for passing in a function and then immediately handing it off to some other context. So this runnable interface has a run function that we're implementing, and all that run function is doing is calling our inline function. Cross inline says, okay, go ahead, don't inline this for sure because we're passing it off to another context, and that other context is going to be responsible for its inlining. All right, that's cross inlining. But overall, function inlining should be used, I think, liberally or aggressively for the name of this talk, okay? Especially if you're exposing some API that's going to be called frequently. That said, you do have to be careful when you're doing so, okay? That performance boost that you're getting by skipping those extra allocations, well, the catch is that you do potentially run into issues um, with whoever is using your, your API. So we've seen now the function type in Kotlin. We've seen how that interoperates with Java, and we've seen higher order functions, both in a like pure lambda calculus context and how they're used within Kotlin. There are a couple patterns where you'll see the most immediate gains um, in replacing your old uh, Java-esque patterns, whether they're in Kotlin or in Java code. And the first of these I want to mention is the callback interface. Who here has written a callback interface? Okay. A callback interface is a way to communicate between two disparate components. And the way that we do this is write an interface. Okay. This is Java code. We write this interface, we'll call it event listener, and event listener has one single abstract method on event occurred. Now, wherever we want to have some code be executed when that event occurred, we provide an implementation for our event listener. We can pass that callback interface around if we want to. So we can pass that event listener to some function, and that other function within its context now knows when that event occurred. Okay? This happens quite frequently in Java code. We can replace our callback interfaces with higher order functions. So we'll skip that entire um, interface creation and go straight to the source. Some function needs to know when our event occurred, okay? This on event occurred higher order function takes nothing as an input and outputs unit, namely nothing. But even though you're not getting a pure input or, or output, what you're getting is notified when that event occurs. So in our case, because on event occurred <coughs> is the last argument passed into some function, we can do our nice little anonymous fun function syntax. And this, overall, is quite a bit cleaner than our callback interface, okay? So if you 
go through this talk and you say, okay, this is all well and good, but you know, I don't know if I really have opportunities to apply these ideas to my code just yet. The lowest hanging fruit for you, I think, will be replacing some of your callback interfaces, okay? Because it does clean up your code considerably and allows you to adopt some more Kotlin-esque patterns. It's really easy to write what I sometimes call like Java code in Kotlin, right? It compiles, right? But you're not adopting some of the platform standards. Um, and while you know callback interfaces are more commonly associated with Java, if you can replace them, you'll end up with a nice clean syntax. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that Kotlin makes uh, functional programming uh, really possible and a bit more uh, intuitive to use. So let's say that we have some list of animals and we want to map those animals into baby animals and we want to map those baby animals into baby animals with cute little noses. Uh, we can do so in just a couple lines here, okay? This map function, the definition of the map function is actually quite complicated. But the syntax here is really straightforward. We're mapping from some input to some output, okay? So we move all of the complexity to the implementation, right? The implementation of the map API is really complicated, but using it is quite easy, okay? And these sorts of paradigms are really made possible by higher order functions and the function type in Kotlin. So to wrap things up, High order functions in you. Replace your callback interfaces, okay? Uh, enable more intuitive syntax, right? If you have a more rich understanding around uh, function types, high order functions, generics, extensions, okay? These all are kind of intermediate to advanced Kotlin topics, but if you develop uh, a fuller understanding of those things, you can really write some nice looking Kotlin code, okay? Be responsible about performance, okay? Function inlining is great. Use it where possible, but you don't have to inline every single thing. Do it where you can, but don't feel bad if it just doesn't make sense at the time. Don't try and force the issue. And lastly, consider interoperability when you're writing code, especially if you're in a shared code base between Kotlin and Java. You know, we can write nice looking Kotlin code all day, but consider your Java counterparts. And that is, uh, is function inlining and kind of an overview of higher order functions in Kotlin. So I hope this talk helped you kind of take the next step from writing code that, you know, Kotlin code that looks like Java to taking advantage of more kind of intermediate to advanced Kotlin features.